Relationship with Food Month, I am chatting with Tanya Streisek. Tanya, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you do? And then we will move on to the topic in hand. Absolutely. So what I do ties very much into who I am. I'm a midlife mom. I'm in menopause. I guess you'd call me postmenopausal. And the relationship with food has been a passion of mine, but consciously for the last few years when I became a holistic nutritionist while taking a mindful eating course and learning about anti-dieting with Christy Harrison, who has a podcast called Food Psych. And I'm also a health professional. I'm a dental hygienist. So here in Canada, we're very well versed about the mouth and how it's connected to your entire health. So that's still like a thing of mine, but I'm really invested in helping women normalize this aging experience, let go of diet culture while helping the body that you have now, because there's so many things you can fill your life with besides counting calories. It's time to make memories and stop talking about calories, people. I agree. <laughs> there we are. Right, we're done. <laughs> but really, we attack attack ourselves with diets when we don't even know what we're really supporting. We are looking for a diet to solve all our problems when really this month is talking about a relationship with food. When you are working with food to try and manipulate your body, what you're saying about yourself speaks volumes. You're really not happy. It's all about your body. It's not about your food. Yeah. Oh, totally. And this is where the relationship with food can be so complex for, for women, because we, we have all these external um, things coming at us from all directions, telling us that we should be smaller and we should fit into such and such a size jeans and, and whatever. And, and when certainly in perimenopause, our body shape changes and we suddenly maybe don't quite recognize this person in the mirror, it can be there can be quite a strong draw to thinking, oh God, well, I'm going to have to control the calories and control the number on the scales because that's the only control I can take back. Control is such a good word because we feel like we need to control our bodies or we should control our bodies. You actually reminded me of something. My mother was in a nursing home for about six years and the clue to me of ditching dieting was already sitting in, but I was walking the halls of the nursing home, looking at all these lovely people who had lives like me, like you, laying in these chairs. And I just thought, what would my legacy be? What is my legacy? I've been smaller. I exercised myself in to a reactivate, like a re, I can't even talk either today, a reactivation of Epstein Barr virus. I ended up extremely sick. I had hepatitis, splenal megaly. I was so sick. I have liver scarring from it, all because I stuck with running while people told me I had a cold. And I, why did I stick with running? I had got what I thought was like, I got there. I got to this body. But what? What did it give me? It got you know, transient, um, well, wow, you look so good. What are you doing? And I'm sick inside, right? It's, yeah. but we, what, that's how we think we're supposed to be. You're 40, you want to be hot because we feel like we are invisible as we age. And so as I walked the halls and I was, now I was recovered and I was like, how am I going to get back into this fitness routine? And oh my gosh, I've gained so many pounds. Hello. My body was moving towards menopause. I was turning 50. So it's so it's just not realistic. And look at what life ends up to be. What do you want your legacy to be? Exactly. I mean, do you genuinely want your headstone on your grave to say, here lies Tanya. Huh, she was wearing a size six. <laughs> what an awesome dieter she was. Shitty <laughs> mother. Or, but, well, or if you wanted to say, here lies Tanya. Well, she, she was pretty epic to be around. You know, <laughs> like... Exactly. Oh, she gave to this. She was a philanthropist and she, she was, it's, yes, it's so, when you put it into these. But even if you take it back to like absolute basics and, and tying in with what you said in your introduction, here lies Tanya. She was a great mum, great partner, great friend, great person. That is so much more important than, you know, oh, she was really good at losing some pounds. Yeah. Who remembers you for being a size, whatever? Absolutely. And yet we're conditioned to, to think we need to be smaller, to take up less space. We are. And as you've talked about many times, Emily, diet culture, it's, it's old, it's, it's racist, it's Victorian. 
And it is oppressive to women, not just women who are white, but other races. And it is, it's getting sneaky, but we buy into it because we want to belong. We want to look a certain way. We feel, we don't even have to be told, do this diet, you'll be sexy. We're bombarded with subliminal images. And I mean, I'm speaking as a white woman with blonde hair. And when you look on Instagram, there's a lot of very pretty young people who are naturally tiny talking about their secret to hormones and menopause. And sometimes I'm asking like, what, you're 30, what do you know? <laughs> but just to bring it back around when we're bombarded with these messages of beauty and youth, why wouldn't we want that? We want that. And I feel for women too, you know, I get, I've done this work and I get caught in that some days, like, yeah, maybe I should, is it really? And then you have to, you know, the body changes and it's very hard to accept when we are buying into a classist system that makes a lot of money. It's, it's difficult, but it's the reality. It is, it is. And it's, it, it pervades into everywhere. You know, I, I, I notice um in in my sort of planet of of fitness instructors and personal trainers it is everywhere in the world of nutritionists it is everywhere even when i go and meet new owners for dog walking people go cool you must be really healthy and then they sort of look me up and down as if to say well i thought you'd be thinner given how much you walk and it's like You know, you just opened up that next section that I think would be great to talk about. We've talked a lot about the health at every size movement. We've talked about Lindo Bacon. And there's been questions in the hub of, okay, you say that a certain size or any size can be healthy, but my doctor is telling me that I need to lose weight to be healthy. And how do you say that that isn't health? You're telling me that not eating um, health foods or healthy food, it doesn't matter anymore. And I think that's where people get stuck. I don't know if you think that. Absolutely. I agree. And I think also that the big diet companies have done a really good brainwashing work on us because there has been there has become this perception that low fat, low calorie stuff is healthy somehow when it's so jam, you know, it's so processed and so jam packed full of whatever that it actually can't really be healthy you know you look at the ingredients on a low-fat yogurt for example and it's like okay i wanted that just to contain milk really yeah yes and food gets this almost mythical moral positioning in the landscape of nutrition when when you think about health and that's where i invite women when i work with women I, I want you to think about your own version of health what is health to you is it running after your kids and grandkids is it making having a great relationship with your partner is it waking up every day feeling rested so that you have the energy to get through there like there's so many things about health that can really be divorced from your pant size yet we have literature that is saying, and professionals, you know, type two diabetes, chronic disease, and that might be true in some cases. And that's where that individuality comes in. You know, I am working on a thyroid course for my company, and we know in science circles that gluten may be like it's molecular mimicry so the body's immune system may attack gluten like the thyroid and that's where we may have a thyroid disruption the thyroid is part of your hormones so for someone maybe they can't eat gluten i have a client who is exactly like that but you know what she said to me she's ukrainian and she's like you know i feel better when i'm not on gluten she's got to that point but i'm ukrainian and with my 90 year old mother we're gonna make pierogies and I'm going to know that I might not feel so good and I don't eat it every day, but it's finding that almost that minimal affected, effective dose of what fits into your life, knowing that, you know, this might not be the best for me, but I'm managing the best I can and I'm going to enjoy this moment. Absolutely. And it, it's looking at the bigger picture as well, isn't it? Because food is a pleasure, you know, exactly as you're saying, for her to be making that um, with her grandmother, that's a huge part of just life and pleasure and joy and if if you only eat the things that are prescriptively healthy 
you potentially miss out on so much stuff. You know, you only have to watch cookery programs to see that what they cook is balanced meals. And yes, they have their veg and they have their protein and, and, and so on and so forth. But, but it's always rich in color, rich in flavor, rich in all sorts of stuff. And it, it adds to the experience of enjoying a meal rather than just going, well, I guess I'm a car, so I'll put some petrol in me and then I'll run for another 50, another 500 miles. Like we're not cars. No, no. And I like that you brought up the color on the plate. That's very much of a mindful eating perspective because when we have, there's so many different hungers. We have eye hunger, heart hunger. When you satisfy your hungers and that's where emotional eating comes in. It's this heart hunger that you're looking to satisfy. And sometimes that hole can't be filled. But when you are able, even one time a day, even a moment of the day to start to bring all that into your meal experience, you may feel more satisfied with what you have rather than just saying, I should eat the salad. Maybe you might get to, I just made this beautiful salad. It's so delicious. I prepared it for me because I deserve it and I actually love it. And I'm going to eat that and I'm and going to be satisfied. Absolutely. And when you do actually listen to what you want in that salad or in that stew or in that pudding, whatever, it doesn't matter. And you knuckle down to the thing that you actually want to eat right now. If it is a salad, as, as your example, then the lettuce suddenly tastes super crunchy. The tomatoes taste super sweet. Everything actually tastes of something because it's what your body wants. Yes. And you know, I've been asked to like, but my body, my body always says I want to have chocolate and I'm not hungry, but my body really says that. And sometimes the body and the mind can get mixed up. But I think another key to this relationship of food, and we've talked about this before too, is to stop judging that. So if, if maybe the healing for your relationship with food is to just eat the chocolate right now, as you start to tune in to what's really happening behind that chocolate craving, maybe it isn't hunger, maybe it's psychological, maybe that's the way you've been coping. Like there's so many layers to the relationship with food. Allowing that to happen is one of your first steps, but women are scared of that. And actually at this point, I want to say to anybody watching this, that Tanya and I give you full permission to eat anything. Absolutely. None of it is bad or naughty. Absolutely. And I think, I think we've almost come full circle to this point where, oh, trying to gather my thoughts here. We know though, we know that if you lived an entire month on chocolate cake, you're probably going to feel pretty crappy. Yeah. We know that plants are pretty healthy, right? Make us feel better. Yes. But when you spend weeks depriving yourself of something that you know psychologically, emotionally, you're going to go binge on down the road, what you're doing physically is bottoming out your blood sugar. You're setting yourself up for thyroid issues. If you can come to this permissive space of allowing food in, things do balance out. They do, absolutely. And this is, this is the big thing with moving towards sort of mindful eating or intuitive eating. I know there are differences, but for the purposes it's, of this, I'll, I'll you yeah, know. But yeah, it is. Together. Um, the, it's, it's the beauty of it is, is starting to trust when your body, what do you always tell you what you want? And if you, if you have a few days, let's say back in that pre-COVID world, you have a few days when you're hectic and you're in and out of meetings and you can't sit and nourish your body with the food that it needs right now because... It just isn't the, the time and space in the day. As soon as there is that time and space, wow, your body calls out loudly for what it wants. Yes, yes. And, and really your emotions does. too. Yes, absolutely. And, and with the emotional thing and, and, and not legalizing eating the chocolate or the cake or whatever, you know, I think every single person who has ever been on a diet has done that thing where they go, I really want some cake, but I can't because that's naughty. So I'll have a satsuma, but that didn't hit the spot. So I'll have an apple. Yeah, that didn't really hit a spot. So I'll have some carrots with hummus. Yeah, that still didn't hit the spot. Oh, I'll have this cereal bar because it says it's healthy on the outside. Still didn't hit the spot. 
just go back, have the chocolate cake in the first place and enjoy it, taste it. Heads up, taste it. I know a lot of us don't taste our food. Um, you know, and you probably find you only want half of it or a quarter of it or, or whatever, but you won't then be chasing around the kitchen after everything else. And feeling overstuffed. But and still, guilty. but still hungry because you haven't actually sated the thing that yeah. you already wanted. Yes. Yeah, I love that you brought that up because I think for for me, I believe and who I work with, we talk about the food relationship first because there are aspects to health, like your gut, like like your brain health, your hormones. They're all tied together. But if you're approaching your food as something that you need to manipulate or feel guilty about then you're never going to get out of the revolving door to be able to approach your food and just start to understand your body's cues and your emotional cues around food. Then you can start to assess food in a different light. You know, you can start to make choices based on, you know, I had cake last night. I probably don't need that cake right now. In fact, I'm going to make this choice right now because I'm gonna have a busy day. I know I'm gonna have a blood sugar crash. I know I have thyroid issues. I had cake, you start to pull it in. Yeah. When you can start to recognize those thoughts though, it's those diet thoughts, like picturing that piece of pie, pie, and looking at the wedge of diet thoughts in relation to the food. If it's a big wedge, then maybe you still have to work on the wedge, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. And it, you know, it's once, all foods are available to you you don't have that desperate need to eat the ones that nourish you less all the time because they're not forbidden that's right and when you brought up intuitive and mindful eating they are similar intuitive eating is a broader yeah. perspective it's a broader framework whereas mindful eating is kind of part of it and mindful eating has its roots in buddhism whereas intuitive eating we know evelyn Tribolet and elise resch they're like the gurus of mindful eating they wrote the book they get misappropriated all the time but really in both platforms what you're doing initially is making that peace with food and dropping the diet mentality in all shapes and sizes in the beginning so that you can start to pick out what's good for you and I, I just thought this, right, given that I'm always sort of banging on about people being kind to themselves, because, you know, we're, we're the best advocate we've got for ourselves. In terms of food, let's say you're inviting some people over for dinner. As a general rule, if someone's inviting people over for dinner, they will go and source nice foods and they will look up recipes that they want to share with people. They'll, they'll create a really nice welcoming maybe slightly over the top but a really decent meal because it's a it's a way of showing love to other people it's a way of expressing that these people matter to you why don't we do that for ourselves that's an excellent question and now we're starting to get into those the, the worth feelings right because women give 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 we give 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 to everybody you're going to make a lovely birthday party for your children or your partner but what about yourself? We feel like it's too much time. We're not worthy. It's a waste of time because we are a little bit up on the productivity wheel a lot, right? You know, go, go, go. But that's so true. And to that note, maybe it isn't food that is your self-care. Maybe you can start to, and in intuitive eating with all the 10 rules or not rules, points, I should say, one of them is to look at the ways that you cope and see what other nurturing things can you do for yourself. So if overeating is one of your things, but you're not hungry and you know you need something, what can you what can you see yourself worthy as? What can you do for yourself? And that's huge. That and, and and really that is the crux of how we address our relationship with food, isn't it? Is by saying, is it food that I need now? Am I hungry for food? Or am I hungry for something else? And if I'm hungry for something else, I wonder what that thing is. I can use food to see if it'll fill that gap. But actually, if I'm really drilled down, am I hungry for a hug? Am I hungry for a walk? Am I hungry for a sleep? 
Am I hungry for, I mean, insert possibilities here. And when we identify that difference between emotional hunger and physical food hunger, really we've got to the crux of the relationship with food, I think. I think you're right. I think the key is creating your own space to identify it. And sometimes you can do a post-mortem on eating episodes. And I have an example a few weeks back. This is how I interrupted my own eating episode. I'm, I've talked about my anxious eating in my podcast. I've been an anxious eater all my life. Many of us have grown up from traumatic homes and it's difficult to talk about. It's difficult to go back there in your mind to repair that, to, to heal that, to even address that. And when we can find that space to, to, and the safety, whether it's with a therapist, you know, a therapist can help you go back, a coach can guide you in what's happening now. But when you create that safety for yourself, you can look at it a little bit. So I was reading a book after dinner, chilling out after eating, was going to walk the dog, but I was going to do a little reading. And I stumbled across something about money. Money is one of my triggers. I grew up poor. We did not have food. So when we got food, especially sugary cereal, I ate the whole box. Yes. And my mother was like, what's wrong with you? Put it, I was six, right? My parents were splitting up. So money has always been a thing for me because I grew up like that. So gosh, not having money, well, and I don't mean millions of dollars. I mean, like, it's not even a real thing. It's like, sometimes I could get back into that thinking of like, I only have X, Y, Z. It's scarcity mindset. Anyway, so this triggered some thoughts and I could feel, I could feel in my body, the heart and the sweat, very tiny, but I could feel it. But my mind went, maybe you should have some of that Easter chocolate. And I'm like, I don't eat chocolate. And I'm reading, I'm reading. No, you know what? you could have some chocolate. And I was getting up off my little bed there and walking to the kitchen to have some chocolate. And I, I ask people to use AA terms like halt or stop. That's not an AA term, but halt. Are you hungry? Are you angry? Are you lonely? Are you tired? And that's a trigger to create that space. Stop for a second. Let's think about this. Allow yourself to think about it. And for me, it's hungry, anxious, lonely, or tired. And I identified that I was anxious. And I know that my modus of operandi like that mode of operandi is to eat and i gave myself all the compassion i saw your webinar the other day in um the live in hub plus talking about compassion self-compassion because that's just the little girl who never knew when the next food was coming and when there was chocolate and we were anxious and our parents were fighting i ate it and i knew that's where that came from but i also knew that i could be okay, you know what? I'm going to have a piece of chocolate or no. And in that moment, I was like, you know what? I, I know what this is. I'm going to honor that I'm anxious about something that isn't even real anymore. And I'm not going to have the chocolate. And I went for my dog walk. Yeah. Sorry, that was long. <laughs> but in that same reflection, the fact of the reflection is the important part there, because by the end of the reflection, you could have still said, and I want the chocolate. And that would have been okay too. Yes, it was. And it could be. Yes, because you're coming at yourself with compassion. And when I did my own work on food and body as a coach, I went to a coach because I can only take people as far as I've gone. This whole idea of what if it's okay for you, Tanya, that you're an anxious individual and right now, or maybe forever, you're going to cope with having a few snacks when you feel anxious. What's, what's the comparison? We went through this together. You know, some people who come from a background like yours are well into drugs and alcohol. You've raised a child and you snack on sugary things sometimes, right? It's what's, what are you all about? What's good for you? And, and letting this, be. this is something I, I, I sort of find myself, and, and this is intentionally a flippant comment, right? But you know, when, when people sort of get bogged down in this idea that they've been naughty by having the snack or whatever, or they've been bad or whatever, it's like, yeah haven't killed anybody seriously like seriously the way we beat ourselves up about having eaten something that we for reasons that we perceive that we shouldn't have eaten you'd think we'd committed some horrific crime and actually all we're doing maybe mindlessly and it doesn't matter because until you've worked through that to get the mindfulness about it but even mindlessly if you are nurturing that little five-year-old in you, you're still, you're, you know, you're not a bad person because of it. 
No, you're actually taking care of that five-year-old. Yeah, and if that happens to happen in the form of food, that's not the end of the world. But by all means, dig deep and understand what's going on. But don't beat yourself up over it, you know. And that's where the, the disconnect, I think, can come. And again, I should, have, I should have said in the beginning, not a medical professional, not giving medical advice, but say a lady is listening to this. Say you're listening to this out there and you're saying, but I have high blood sugar and I should, I, I've been told I shouldn't be eating all of this sugar. And I struggle with that. This is where getting to the bottom of the emotional connection can be very helpful. But in the meantime, can you pair that treat with something with protein, fat, fiber, and slow the, the blood sugar entrance to your body? You know, you've probably gone to a doctor where they say, just go on a diet. It's easy. Go on a diet, right? It's not that easy when you're that person, when you're a person like I am, who is inexplicably tied to a fridge hug from childhood. Yeah. So what can you add in to help that, to help your gut, to help whatever it is you're trying to manipulate as far as your body? Because that's the, at the end of the day, when you think about what we're doing for health, of course, we want to be mobile. We want to be uh, without chronic disease. We're afraid of disease. We're afraid of death. And we also are afraid of gaining weight. That's where all of this worry and feeling bad about chocolate comes in. What is it tied to? You're not fighting with food. You're fighting with your body. Yeah. And, and exactly as you say, if, you know, if you've got the emotional eating habit, which a lot of us have, which is why we're covering off relationship with food, there is always something underlying that. And it comes down to how much, I guess, you, you value yourself going forwards as to whether you're prepared to unravel those underlying emotions because those emotions are crying out to be to be looked at to be heard and and keeping putting food on top of them is just quietening them for now it's not giving them the chance to actually get unraveled so you know you've said that that you you've identified the link between not knowing where food's coming from when you were little i've um identified a link between going off to boarding school and food at boarding school was definitely not made with love <laughs> <laughs> and so I had a distinct difference between food at school was fuel. It literally was something you had to eat so that you weren't hungry. Um, and then I'd come home and food would be love and food was a celebration. And it was, you know, you'd go to granny's house and she'd fill the house with all these amazing cakes and stuff. And at age kind of eight, nine, ten. That's a really difficult message to, to, to cut through. And so it gives you this kind of weird thing of like, well, I understand there's fuel food, but it didn't taste very nice. And I understand that there's love food and that tastes really good. And it's surrounded by hugs and warmth and happiness. So funnily enough, then when you're missing out on the love, the warmth, the happiness, all those things, which by the way, in a global pandemic can be missing from life, Oh, oh, I think I'm just going to go for food because frankly, that might just give me love and warmth and happiness. And, and if it doesn't, well, I'll have eaten something and it'll have tasted nice. Yes, that's, you hit it, right? Like in so many levels, the identification of warmth and love through food but being in periods of drought deprivation and dryness without humans that are invested in you they are in your education and they have to keep you living <laughs> but and yeah, you know that sounds so <laughs> and that sounds terrible but you mean it's it's um you're you're in an institutionalized education system so of course they're not going to care about you like home makes so much sense and you know, and, and you know, we've covered this off before, but it's also the the external things that you hear. So as a small child, you keep hearing, oh, well done, you've got a big appetite. Oh, isn't it great? You, you enjoy your food and blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly, oh, you've had a bit much, actually. And you're sort of like, hang on a sec. You just told me a good appetite, a big appetite was a good thing. And now you're telling me I shouldn't have an appetite. Um, yes. When does that happen? As soon as you become more womanly and you're yeah, around puberty. Yeah, measure to those womanly expectations. 
And then we're stuck with that expectation until we finally see through it. Yes, but we also perpetuate it in each other. I don't know about you, but when I was allowed to go out and have dinner with my friends, what happens when you walk into a restaurant? Oh, so good right and it starts from there I know I was on the south beach I feel great or oh I couldn't even do I know I've gained another 20 pounds I've got to get going again give me another margarita like it's ridiculous we celebrate it's it's right pervasive it's everywhere you know and yet if you observe men generally when they catch up they don't go see you've put some weight on or oh dude you're looking amazing What have you been doing? It's just not, it's just like, oh, did you watch the football? Yeah. Fancy a pint? Yeah. Absolutely. I recorded a solo episode on the Fullness Podcast of Body Image in your 50s. And I was just finishing watching, I don't know, probably for the third time, the movie It's Complicated with Alec Baldwin and Meryl Streep. There's a scene where they're going to have sex. They've had kids together. They're just having an affair, just. And she is so embarrassed to be seen with her body she's like got the bathrobe on she's like oh I don't know if I want to let it down and there's Alec Baldwin in the door frame god hanging exactly come on baby come and get it right that's what we need to do switch roles yeah because every single one of us is beautiful exactly as we are yes and and that doesn't mean in a pin-up Instagram way but we're beautiful because We aren't a pin-up Instagram person. We're beautiful because we laugh. We're beautiful because we're kind. We're beautiful because we're compassionate. We're beautiful for whatever reason. But it's so much bigger than just the the skin that holds our bones and our internal organs in place. You just gave me goosebumps saying that, you know, because no, but you know, we have such a hard time. And I know I've struggled with this, like that we have such a narrow image, visual of what beauty is that we rarely look to those other qualities and celebrate them in ourselves and sometimes with our friends. Yeah, and I wonder, this is just me thinking out of the box here. I wonder if, you're, if you are visually impaired, presumably you judge people on actually their decent qualities. Yes, and even deeper, how they sound, their voice, yeah. their energy. You can get a sense of who they are. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine that, eh? Yeah. So profound. That's so good. So you have some questions for people to ask of themselves about their relationship with food. Is that right? Yes. So if you are listening to this and you're wondering, do I have to change my relationship with food? Do I want to develop a better relationship with food? Do I even have a relationship with food? Yes, you do. We all do. Just like people, relationships we can have a conflicted relationship, a harmonious relationship, right? We can have a judgmental relationship. And so start to ask yourself, what word would my relationship with food be? If I could pick a word, what is it? That's one thing. And when you want to get a little deeper into say, changing your relationship with food or understanding it, and even asking if you're fighting with food, how many diets have you been on? How many diets have you been on in your lifetime to get to the same result? And maybe you are someone who's been quote unquote successful at maintaining a certain weight. It's probably not without effort at times and you probably have cheats and you know, that's still dieting, but how many have you been on? Because that is like a window to your relationship with food, right? And I think too, we can ask ourselves how often we eat for comfort or for coping. That's another window into your food relationship and not in the sense that it's bad. See, that's the thing. Emotional eating gets a bad rap, but food is a connection like a style through cultures, through times we connect with food, funerals, birthdays, right? You, we already touched on that. It's really just looking at how many times you feel like you have to reach for food to comfort yourself. And that is where you may feel some conflict. So you could look at that, right? 
And looking at your relationship with food, what do you label food as? How often do you label them? Do you have food frenemies? And if you do, a frenemy might be chocolate. What is behind that frenemy? Why, why has chocolate been positioned as bad in your mind? And you can write down all the things that have led you there. Things like that can help you start to dig into that relationship with food because it's a relationship with yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think on that note, we've given people some things to, to think about. So I think that's a good moment to say thank you very, very much, Tanya. And um, we'll speak again very soon. I'm always excited to chat with you, Emily. Thank you.